Hi, I'm a human. I've got hands and a mouth and a name and all of my parts. They work together for the benefit of, well, me. If you looked really closely at me under a microscope, what you would find are cells. I'm a multicellular creature. There was a time, oh, I don't know, maybe like a billion years ago, something like that, when the only kind of life on the planet was unicellular life. So how did evolution take us from this to this? Well, I just read this paper called Experimental Evolution of Multicellularity, and the experimental design is just like spot on, and the results they get are fascinating, so I want to tell you about it. Their experiment was done on yeast. This is my sourdough culture. It's pretty similar to the yeast culture they were using, so I'm going to use it to show you how they did the experiment. What they did is they grew yeast in test tubes like this one. They would incubate the yeast for 24 hours to allow enough cells to grow, and then they would shake the tube really vigorously. Then they would put the tube back and let it sit for just a few minutes to allow some of the cells to settle, the heaviest ones. Once the cells had a few minutes to settle, they would use a pipette to remove just the bottom layer of cells, the cells that had settled the fastest, and they used those to produce the next generation. They repeated this procedure every day for several weeks. Each time, they selected the bottom layer of cells for the next generation. In effect, they were selecting the cells for adaptations which would allow them to settle faster. Basically, they were selecting for bigness. The bigger you are, the faster you fall. As an enterprising yeast cell, there are two ways for you to get bigger. The first is simply to grow bigger, but there are some problems with that strategy. It has to do with surface area to volume ratio. It's kind of a dead end. But there's another way to get bigger. What if you could give up your individual yeast identity and become a part of a yeast collective, a multicellular snowflake creature? This image here shows that large-celled yeast do evolve in this experimental setup. You can see how much bigger this guy is from this small cell here. But what was a much more common solution to the settling selection problem was this multicellular snowflake yeast pattern. So down here there are all these vials, and each vial contains a population of yeast that has been selected for settling a different number of times. So the population in this vial over here has been selected 60 times, whereas the population in this vial over here has not been selected at all. And look how big of a difference there is between this vial, seven generations, and this vial, 14. There's a ton of yeast at the bottom here. So this indicates that this multicellular snowflake pattern evolved somewhere between generation 7 and 14 in this version of the experiment. The researchers replicated this experiment 10 times, and in each case, multicellular snowflake yeast evolved by at most the 60th generation, and in many cases, much sooner. So we know that the yeast have been selected to settle quickly, and we know that snowflake yeast settle faster than individual yeast, but how do we know that the snowflake yeast are actually multicellular creatures and not just groups of individual yeast cells? Well, because of a process called apoptosis. Researchers found significantly higher rates of apoptosis in the snowflake yeast compared to individual yeast cells, but the cell deaths weren't random. Certain cells in specific places in the snowflake yeast body were giving up their lives to aid in the reproduction of the whole. See, snowflake yeast evolved with a mutation which allowed yeast cells to stick together after they divided. So as the snowflake grows, it develops this branching pattern. Cells at the tips of the branches are direct descendants of cells at the base. Reproduction occurs when a branch of the snowflake breaks off, and branches break off more easily when the cell at their base dies. So apoptosis is necessary for the entire snowflake to reproduce. 
At the start of the experiment, apoptosis was rare and tended to occur only in the middle of snowflakes, producing two clusters of roughly the same size. But as the experiment progressed, higher rates of apoptosis evolved. Cell death became common at the edges of the snowflake, producing asymmetrical divisions. Smaller snowflakes are able to grow faster than larger ones, so increasing apoptosis at the edges greatly increased the number of offspring that a snowflake could have. Watch what happens in this video. The snowflake grows, and then it breaks apart, and then it quickly breaks apart again. What's being reproduced here isn't individual cells, but groups of cells. The fact that apoptosis is required for these snowflakes to reproduce provides a very strong argument that a snowflake is not just a group of yeast cells cooperating with each other, but that it's actually a multicellular organism with a shared fate. Individual yeast cells almost never self-destruct like this in the wild. What would be the point? By sacrificing their lives for the benefit of the whole, the yeast cells demonstrate that who they are, in an ultimate sense, is not an individual cell, but the entire structure. The success of any individual cell in the snowflake is completely contingent upon the success of the whole. I want to be careful not to overstate too much what this research means, because yeast is actually quite unique. It's one of the few unicellular creatures that we think actually evolved from a multicellular ancestor. Which is to say that the snowflake evolution in this experiment was strongly biased by the yeast's previous history. Yeasts will commonly stick to each other like this even when there isn't strong selection for cluster size, so the experimental results can't actually explain the first time that multicellularity evolved. But still, the researchers chose yeast for a reason. They knew that it had the bias that it did, that's why they chose it. What the researchers showed was not how multicellularity first evolved, but rather the series of steps required to make it happen. My body is made up of trillions of cells, but they are all part of one self. Me. How my cells managed to do this remains a mystery. A mystery that this research puts us one step closer to understanding.